All right, everybody, welcome. My name is Jesse Randall. I'm the CEO and founder of Sweater, and we are the host of Founder Saga. Uh, we're excited always to be able to bring in founders to talk more about what it's like to actually live in the trenches uh, and get through that early stage of from the back of the napkin idea until you get your first outside funding. Uh, it's by, heart, by far the highest risk portion and where most of us tend to stumble. So no better way to learn than to bring in people that have made it through the other side. And Jonathan is no, exa or is, uh, no exception to that. So Jonathan, thank you for being with us. You bet. Thanks, Jesse. Yeah. So, um, John, you're the CEO of Kitty Hawk, and you know you'll tell the Kitty Hawk story way better than me. So, why don't we take a couple of minutes and have you kind of give a quick pitch for uh, what Kitty Hawk's objective is and and your mission, um, and then we'll get into more about how you ran into it later. Cool. Yeah. Thank you. So, um, really, our, our mission is how how can we help people and, and companies fly as we enter this really second century of aviation. And we got started really seeing this, this new technology that was really disruptive. And um, aviation is very entrenched. Uh, we have the FAA, we have regulators, we have a few different uh, big companies that, that deal with all of this, but it's really predicated on World War II era systems that are, that are manual, that are analog, that involve people. And we really see not just uh, people, but companies that are not transportation or aviation companies becoming the biggest users of aviation mm -hmm. and really mm -hmm. focus on building the tools, the infrastructure, the systems that is going to enable that. And hopefully we can help uh, you and your kids fly, fly safer as recreational drone pilots. And hopefully we can help uh, companies and uh, large logistic companies and the future of uh, air taxis and so on to, to really take to the skies and, and access low altitude air, airspace that is relatively untapped. It's not well thought about, but it's mm -hmm. where all of these flights are going to take place. Yeah, no, I love it. The second century of flight. I love that. That's yeah. really cool. Um, so you know, like where are you guys at right now in terms of like kind of traction and impact? I mean, you've got some great partnerships and investors that really speak to you leading the mission into this space. So can you tell us a little more about that? Yeah, so we, uh, I know we're still seed stage, fairly fairly early going, but we got started um, just about six years ago. Um, actually, the company got started on December 17th, uh, which was semi-coincidentally the the anniversary of flight going back to, to Kitty Hawk's uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, founding days. Uh, it's an official company holiday. Uh, don't take much seriously. <laughs> um, That's great. But you know, really over the last five years, been very user-centric, customer-centric. What, what are people going to need that's both useful today, but also sets you up for the future of where you're going? And I, I think that's been part of what, what has really driven a lot of our success was um, especially in a new industry where it's like, hey, we see what this future looks like with drones buzzing all over and doing deliveries and all this cool stuff. But it's like, how do we get there? And it's, um, if you just start building for that future scale world, it, you're probably not going to have the right traction or understand really how do you get there. And for us, we really just focus on, hey, what do companies need to do to start flying today? And, and how do we go to that next step? So probably the best mm -hmm. example is um, the really the first versions of Kitty Hawk were very operations focused. It was like flight logs, checklists, um, things that are core to aviation, but new uh, in the drone space. And then uh, probably the last two years, we've really built uh, a lot of our, our platform and new technology around airspace. How do you manage that? Um, mm -hmm. We're approved by the FAA to grant airspace authorizations in controlled airspace. Um, we're now the leader of that. We do over 50% of, of all authorizations today. Um, we also have partnered exclusively, excuse me, exclusively with the FA to build Before You Fly, which is their official airspace application. So it's really given us uh, a nice way to um, serve our customers. They need to fly. How do we impact safety? How do we impact compliance? Um, and those, those two things are central to, to really capture the, the ROI that's possible when you fly. Yeah, that's awesome. So, I mean, we talk about the future of this airspace usage and it being like non-commercial flight. 
So, I mean, can you kind of expand on what the vision of that is like, what it's trending towards? I mean, obviously there's like Amazon drone deliveries and stuff like that. I'm sure it goes well beyond what Amazon plans to do. So how do you, how will you be a part of that? So we're really trying to think about the entire airspace and just to take the US for example, um, controlled airspace. So all of the airspace around big airports where you have to get authorized to fly, that accounts for 1% of the total airspace in the US. The other 99% is uncontrolled airspace. It's, it's airspace that traditionally you can do whatever you want in. You wanna hop in a little plane, take off at a small airport, fly around, you can. Uh, when you're flying a drone though, it, you still need that level of, of safety and there's still that question of what kind of regulations, what kind of rule sets are going to enable flight in uncontrolled airspace. And it's just not that well defined. Um, and, and it varies quite a bit. So, so class G uncontrolled airspace could be the middle of nowhere in Wyoming. It could be downtown San Francisco. Both are class G uncontrolled mm -hmm. airspaces that need to be thought of in a, in a different way. It's not binary controlled or uncontrolled. There's a lot of stuff going on. And then the other interesting part uh, with drones is more than ever, the local rules matter. Um, so it's not just about the airspace, it's where you're taking off from, where are you landing, where are you operating? Right. And that's where you see a lot of places where you might have good airspace, but you're not supposed to fly. So it could be, right. could be state parks. Um, here in San Francisco, you're not supposed to take off or land in city parks. And uh, we now show those kind of advisories uh, in our applications to let people know, hey, you're not supposed to fly here. Even though from the FA's viewpoint, that's good airspace. It's not a good place to operate from. So it's this unique combination of local data, um, city and state kinds of restrictions that are gonna match with airspace restrictions. Right. And ultimately those data sets that have never had to talk to each other come, come in to be. And then, you know, the, the other kind of the third piece of that too is the general public. This is still a very new technology. When, when you hear a drone over your house, you're like, what is this? Um, and that's natural. That, that's the way things happen when, right. when we have new pieces of technology. We used to freak out about cell phones. Like, oh, what? can you bring a cell phone into a locker room? And now it's like, well, of course you can. You're like, you need to check your email yeah, and right. get on Twitter. Um, but that's just a natural piece of this. So how do we start to get um, comfortable with, with drones operating very close to us? Because mm. per... Uh, regulations it's an aircraft just like uh, uh, you might have a Boeing jet flying over your house it's doing so at 30,000 feet and you're used to it um, how do we start to think about deliveries and inspections and and we say that a lot with a lot of our customers like uh, travelers insurance who are in neighborhoods flying drones to inspect roofs instead of climbing up on ladders um, they get a lot of questions from from neighbors what's going on mm. um, and it's, it's just part of that. How do we educate and engage the general public while we kind of bring this new technology to market? It's, it's something that all, all of the, I think, big companies, especially delivery companies are thinking about is how do you breed that level of trust? When a UPS truck shows up, it's like, okay, it's that big brown truck. I know what that means. Um, mm -hmm. I've had Amazon deliveries where it's like a used Honda uh, you know, and it's like, who, <laughs> so where is this package coming from? You know, that, how do we get to that brown truck kind of delivery? Um, right. Yeah. That's that's where we need to get to. Yeah, it's really that's a really good visual. So let, let's jump back in time. Let's talk about where this idea came from. I mean, I called the back of the napkin. I mean, where were you? What were you doing? What led you to thinking that you could build this this infrastructure for the, the second century of flight? It's pretty ambitious. <laughs> We, we certainly didn't uh, start off with, uh, I think, that level of ambition, but uh, um, you know, I think at the core, we saw you know, a lot of the building blocks coming to be with regulations, technology, and um, you know, it was, it was kind of just typical uh, San Francisco, at least before San Francisco became a wasteland where uh, uh, a friend of mine, he, he was deep into drones, aviation. Uh, he had flown, flown model airplanes for a while. Um, so he, he really was, was into this space. Um, he is a poetry major, but a self-taught coder. Um, I kind of come more from the, the business side of things and, and finance side of things, but a self-taught 
coder as well on the iOS side. And so um, we used to have a group of friends that would get together on like Wednesday night and we just hack on stuff. And so this kind of became our, our main project. Um, he was building the website, uh, the APIs. I was building the mobile side of this. And for the first, um, it's about the first year, this was just like purely side project where it was, it was what uh, I would work on uh, mm -hmm. nights, weekends, um, during my day job, a lot of times, you know, kind of started to overtake <laughs> that. We, we um, won't tell anybody. As any good employee should, but, uh, uh, you know, really it was, hey, let, let's get our product out there. And I think, you know, the, the piece that really fueled us in those early stages was once we um, published our first app, like people were downloading it companies were downloading it. I think in the first couple months, um, this was, you know, back when we would like track every email address that came in, you know, like we get an email like, hey, this person signed up. Uh, eventually we, you know, we turned that off and it was like too, too noisy, but um, you know, we saw like Disney signed up for the app and Caterpillar and Major League Baseball. And I was like, wow, these companies are going into the app store and finding this, like mm -hmm. that's, that's telling. Um, and then the other piece though is just really validating was uh, just a lot of uh, really fervent uh, Kitty Hawk fans, Kitty Hawkers that were like, this is awesome. Thank you. Do you take donations? And it was like, just, just leave us a good review. Um, appreciate your support. Um, but I think we got that knowledge, that feedback. Um, we used to have a call the founders button in the app, like random people could just tap and call us and, um, mm -hmm. Yeah, some of the That's conversations cool. were a little weird, but you know, in the early <laughs> days, it's good to it's good to engage with with that kind of stuff. And we you know, were able to just learn a lot, keep iterating, and um, get get that early traction that uh, that you need to to really fuel fuel it going forward. Yeah, it's awesome. So you worked on this for a year on nine weekends before you decided to go full time on it. Yeah, Is that right. Yeah. So yeah. what? Tell us about like the original, just real briefly. What was the original purpose then? Like, was it just uh, more like checklists and stuff, like you said earlier? Uh, so like the very first uh, version of the app, you could sign in and then log like a manual flight. You're like, hey, I was flying at this location, flew for seven minutes, and here's my flight notes. Um, that mm -hmm. was all you could do. And then we started adding in, um, really thinking about that entire workflow. What are the pre-flight tools that you need? checklists, airspace, weather, um, risk assessments. Uh, what do you need post-flight with better logs, detailed telemetry? Um, so it started to, to kind of build in those other pieces that, that's completed this workflow. Um, but it was, it was super bare bones from, from the beginning. And um, you know, not being a professional coder, it was uh, um, I think definitely we did things that were, you know, ugly and cringeworthy for an engineer. But I think that's the nice thing about coding is there could be better, more efficient ways to do it. But what does the end user see? And they, they don't see that uh, something that took me 12 lines of code could have been done in two. Doesn't matter. It's like, hey, does this button perform nicely? How's the design? Um, so those are the things that, that I think we really nailed early on. Yeah. Okay. That's, that's awesome. Um, oh, I want to ask you a little bit more about like your, your ability to code in that. I mean, you know, you and I'm at a business school, right? So you came out and you learned how to code mm -hmm. since then, you know, so you're self-taught and you jumped into that. I mean, I, I mean, myself included, I'm, I know a lot of people that are intimidated by coding and it's funny. Cause I always think to myself, oh, I'm too old to code. I like to learn how to do this. I'm too deep in my career. And then about every three years, I'm like, geez, if I just would have started three years ago, I'd know how to do it by now. <laughs> You know, and so it's like, I, I keep like giving myself a hard time. Um, so really quickly, I, what would be your advice for, you know, for non-technical people who have ideas and, and want to code? I mean, you clearly took it far enough to make it a reality. So just real briefly, I mean, like, what's your advice there for those that might want to jump in? I think uh, probably the, the thing that really helped me was, um, and I, I had been where, you know, where you describe yourself being, um, a number of times where I was like, hey, let me, let me learn Ruby or Python, you know, whatever kind of the language is that it sounds interesting. But um, 
Yeah, I think what really helped me was having a clear kind of, hey, what's my first project going to be? And um, I think the, the nice thing about learning uh, iOS and, and Swift had just come out, um, it was a much simpler, just nicer looking language mm -hmm. compared to Objective-C, kind of what iOS apps used to be written in. So um, the nice part about iOS is you, it's easier to create a product or an app that someone could use or that you could put on your phone. Like even if you're not gonna distribute it, it's, it's easier to get that full product experience. Whereas if you learn to code some sort of backend language, you're not really putting something out there that could be touched or seen or, or played with. So I think that just helped me to think about, hey, here's a button, what do I want this button to do? And there's that full kind of experience and that, that's kind of what I always, I think was kind of a block for me was like, if I'm gonna learn some language, what it, what can I do with it? And you really can't do a lot without other pieces. Whereas mm -hmm. learning, um, I think on the mobile side, you can create that full product beginning to end if you want to. And so my my first uh, project that was really what, uh, what I got started on was a breastfeeding app. And we were just about to have our first- I remember that. Yeah, and, yeah, I uh, totally forgot. What yeah. was the name of that? I'm trying um, to remember. It's called Air Bear. I totally remember when you launched that. Yeah. yeah. So it was, uh, um, you know, something that gave me structure on, hey, what what do I need to build? Um, you know, very specific kind of objective, like, cool, what should this look like? Mm -hmm. um, I don't know what what uh, is out there now, but at the time there were a bunch of apps, but they were like really ugly. They were old. They were super complicated. Like tracking naps and so it's like no one's tracking that it's like you don't care <laughs> um, so i was just like what's a simple i just want to answer the question uh is the baby hungry like that was always the question was like you know is it time um especially if you know for your, for your first kid there's just a lot of those questions so that was the one thing i said to do was just answer that question so it's super simple fun kind of interface um you get some fun messages after you completed it um, and it was nice, like it was similar to, to Kitty Hawk is like people were using it. It, it was, uh, that's motivating usage. Um, mm -hmm. and so, um, that kind of taught me that, that full experience from code design, publishing it, like getting something in the app store. What, what does that entire process look like? So, um, I think the couple of things I would say, you know, in addition to, have have kind of that project that you know what's an outcome that you can drive to is mm -hmm. uh, what's really unique about the developer community is people share ideas they share code if you have questions that question has probably been asked and you know I basically lived on Stack Overflow and YouTube to mm -hmm. to learn that stuff um, yeah you have a question you're like hey how can I do this I guarantee you that question has been asked and answered and People will just say, hey, here's my code of how I do this. Um, so it's it's one of those things where, uh, as opposed to like finance, where like, hey, if you come up with the best Excel model, like you're not gonna post that online for anyone to use, like that's yours. Um, but for people who, who are writing code, they, they share stuff all the time. So mm -hmm. between open source sharing of, of code and, and uh, best practices and and good old YouTube, you're, you can get going. So give it yeah. a try. Yeah, you're, you're totally an inspiration. <laughs> I'm, so I've got a 12 year old son that enjoys this stuff and we've kind of got some Minecraft coding things, but it sounds like, you know, making the jump to doing something that's real and tangible might be closer than I give it credit for. Yeah. Yeah, no, you could, uh, you know, download Xcode and, you know, put, put something together of like, hey, put a button on something, put a date picker, like whatever it is, like those components exist. Like you could, mm -hmm. you could have something. Yeah. That's cool. <laughs> I'm going to write that down. Yeah. <laughs> I know. Right, I well, let's, thought let's, about, yeah. you know, I'm super rusty right now. Like I, fortunately all of my code has, I think pretty much been overwritten, but um, <laughs> I still right. have ideas sometimes where it's like, you know, Super Bowl's coming up like, Oh, like a, a square pick'em game would be kind of fun to do an app for that or something. 
Um, yeah. I don't know. I think just once you kind of have that, it's like you can think like, oh, what what's something that you could you could play with, and um, mm -hmm. it's. I don't know. There's definitely times where it's frustrating. The one thing that was totally new to me was when you're coding something, it can be broken and you're not sure why and something that used to work now doesn't work. And if you're working on, on a PowerPoint deck, like it's never not broken and never like, hey, I can't, why can't I print this? Like it's always printable, you know? Uh, yeah. Not that way for, for code. So there's, there's certainly like a new frustration element to it, but um, super, super rewarding and just mm -hmm. the, there's a lot of tools out there that that make it uh, easy to to just think better about that stuff. Yeah, it's awesome. So if we circle that back into your story, then I mean, so you spent a year, you and a buddy, just coding away on this thing. It sounds like you released multiple versions. And then you came mm -hmm. to a point where you decided to quit your job. Now, this this is always a moment, right? So one of the things I want to talk about was really how you survive, right? Because one of my big themes is always survival, right? The longer you can survive personally, financially through this period, the more the likelihood or the higher likelihood of, of actually getting your thing into market and finding success. So at some point you quit your job and I, I don't know the full story, but I'm guessing you probably didn't have a bunch of funding lined up. So what was, what was the transition there and what was your plan for making it through that period? Sorry, I'm so the time and day where I start to get blinded <laughs> out of my, my trusty uh, curtain closer here. Um, <laughs> so actually for, for me, it lined up pretty well where um, the company I was working for, um, they were kind of, they weren't doing great and I think they were getting ready to shut stuff down. Um, but I think we, we closed around like before our, or like right when I was leaving there, so. Oh, that's great, okay. Um, so the timing was actually really good. I think the, you know, the, the tougher parts I think is, is getting to that point where um, it's like when it's your, your side gig, you know, side project, mm -hmm. how can you build enough momentum to where it's like, hey, we're having this amount of traction working on it a few hours a week. What if we worked full time mm -hmm. on it? What well, what's the potential? Um, and yeah, I think it's impossible to know like to time funding or understand like when you're gonna get funded. So you know, unless you have savings uh, lined up, like I would say, try and keep your job as long as you can. Um, yeah. But uh, but there does come a point where it's like you kind of need to be fully committed and probably most investors are going to look for that uh, commitment level mm -hmm. um, but I think it's a given that hey if you if you close funding that you're going to go work full-time on it like that's probably a given so most important thing is how do you show traction and maintain that traction if it is your side project mm -hmm. Oh, absolutely. I didn't realize that you you came that you did that job tra job transition with funding uh, ready there. That's awesome. Um, yeah, so I, 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 I think the it's specifics, but it was it was pretty close to uh, yeah. closing that and and moving on. Yeah. So I mean, I think it's worthwhile discussing what it's like to actually balance doing nights and weekends and day job. I get this question all the time. Like, what what can I do? Is my company gonna own what I'm making? You know, like, what if they find out? Should I be transparent or should I just, you know, kind of do it when I need to and, and hope nobody finds out? Like, from your experience doing it for, you know, a pretty good amount of time, what would you advise? What works for you? Um, so, I'd say you, you definitely want to do things the right way. Uh, you don't want to create some success and then learn like, oh, because I was coding on my work computer that there's some sort of issue there or something. So do things the right way. Uh, I think if you're working somewhere full time, like you should do do that job really well. Like it, it shouldn't detract from it. Mm -hmm. um, like just naturally there'll be times where it's like, hey, you have an idea and you wanna like work on something um, related to your side project, not your day job. 
So I think just how do you balance that? Um, how do you be upfront with that? But even with um, with like uh, on Airbear, like I would work on that, um, you know, at the office, like after after work or something. So um, and people were pretty supportive of it. You know, they give me five stars and, and that sort of stuff. So um, yeah, I think just you don't want one to sacrifice the other. And it, it's certainly a challenge. Mm -hmm. Like you don't want your performance at your day job to suck because that's not going to be a good outcome. And uh, you know, I think if you have the passion and it's driving you, you're going to find time to, to do both really well and, and make that sacrifice to, to make it possible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's cool. Um... So I want to ask you more specifically, if, if I remember correctly, I mean, you have a relationship with Boeing, right? Mm -hmm. So I'd like to explore that because it, to me, when I, I remember observing that when it happened, I remember thinking in my head like, wow, that was a, that's a big partnership to get at the stage that you're at. So like, tell us more about that. I mean, it may not be a reality for every company to go and land that kind of a partnership and alignment with someone like Boeing, but you know, it's great to hear the stories because you never know, like if you've heard this stuff before, maybe it might lead you down a different path in the future. So would you mind sharing like kind of how that all came to be? Yeah, so um, I guess, you know, a little bit before that. So we had um, done a few different, uh, probably today you'd call them like pre-seed rounds. Um, but uh, first, our first investor, just one, one uh, kind of aerospace space focus fund. Um, they invested 500K and then they, I think about six months after that, put in another million. Mm -hmm. and so that, that was when we kind of started building our team a little bit more. Um, and then we were getting, uh, getting ready for, for our, our kind of more official seed round. And uh, I think there's, there's kind of a stigma that comes with strategic investors, you know, is there, um, is there a real benefit to it, um, or does it uh, does it stifle future potential? You know, if you're um, getting money from Intel or Qualcomm, or it seems like every right, company yeah. has a venture fund these days. Um, when you <laughs> look at true. it, um, you know, we have a few customers like Shell. They have a venture fund. Um, it's pretty standard nowadays, and I think what what we've seen is that it provides a nice balance um, to the traditional kind of institutional investors um, that um, probably have a different time frame, different different mindset. Um, so, so for us, we have two strategic investors, um, Boeing, and then also Travelers Insurance, and mm -hmm. it's nice just having some of their perspective, like their long-term focus kinds of companies. Um, Boeing's obviously had a bunch of issues, you know, lately, but, uh, yeah, I think the thing that, that attracted, um, them to what we were doing was it was, uh, kind of territory that they had no, no kind of visibility into. Like they were used to cool, big planes operating at high altitude. Here's all the systems and things that we need to do that. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, they had a pretty active venture fund just trying to think, okay, what is this whole ecosystem look like? And so, um, yeah, I'd say one is just a good validator to, you know, to have a name like that to invest with you. And then if they can provide a little more value along the way, great. But um, yeah, I think it's, uh, it's one of those things in terms of like, who are your investors going to be like, if you're lucky enough to, to where you have like a bunch of people fighting over you, great. You know, you can be more selective, but the main thing is just who, uh, you know, who's going to fund that next round that that you need to to continue on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, totally. So that long term mindset that they bring to the table is really nice, right? It kind of, uh, especially given what you're building. I mean, it keeps you away from like just hitting little, you know, quarterly or annual goals. I mean, you've you've certainly got a long term vision um, uh, for what is possible and what's coming next. Um, you know, like what is their involvement like? Has it mostly been a check or like, do they actually really get involved with you? Uh, yeah, they're, they're pretty involved. So they're, um, they're a board observer. Um, so they, 
uh, participate at, at all our board meetings. Um, but they're they're also pretty. Um, they have a pretty significant program of hey, how can we help all of the different uh, founders and CEOs that they invest in? Um, so, like pre COVID, we'd have um, different events where they get us together. Um, and cover different topics. Now let's kind of move to more virtual stuff in terms of, uh, hey, let's have a, a, a webinar on, on SPACs or a webinar on COVID safety. Like there's just a lot of stuff yeah. like that. So, um, you know, that's where I'd say they're probably unique in being a strategic investor where they have a lot of infrastructure around how do we support that. Um, mm -hmm. Not just about how do you work more with Boeing, but how do you um, just provide other kinds of resources, education. Um, so they have, they have a whole kind of portfolio development team that that assists with that. So that's been uh, you know really nice to to work with them. And then mm -hmm. uh, you know if there's specific things, uh, if we have questions about. Um, policy or regulations, uh, help with a particular customer or feedback on, on our pitch deck, uh, really, really supportive. So um, they, they've been pretty cool to work with. And you know, I'd say even you know, while they're going through COVID 737 max issues, like they're more, more engaged than ever. So mm -hmm. they're, it's- uh, Yeah, that's awesome. They sound and like I a great partner. Just, yeah, compared to, um, it's just nice to have that that balance with traditional VCs and and them. So, mm -hmm. yeah, that's great. Um, so I guess you know, like if we go back and just focus for a minute, just on that that early stage. I mean, call it you know between twenty fifteen and twenty seventeen. Um, you know, was there a, a point there where like where you were wondering whether or not this was going to make it past the next checkpoint? Because I mean, you mentioned that like, once you start raising funding, right, you're always kind of aiming for that next funding round and what does it need and require? And are we going to have the resources uh, to hit the, those requirements and keep this thing going? So have you ever, have you been in a position as the founder where you're like, you're kind of wondering, you know, if you're going to make it? Oh, all, all the time. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it's too obvious of a question. <laughs> yeah, well, I think I think uh, probably the biggest you know kind of question mark that that we had was kind of between um, our kind of pre seed one point five round and then the the five million seed round that we did with uh, with Boeing and and some other VCs because um, that's where uh, I know there's just proof points milestones things that different. Um, investors look for. And so I'd say that was probably the moment where, um, you know, we had a lot of traction, we had really good names, um, but it was, it wasn't uh, clear like, Hey, where, who, what's this next round going to look like? And it ended up being awesome. And with some of the names that, that you mentioned, but um, I don't know, timing, timing and just traction and how do you create that sense of urgency with investors. Um, and, you know, I think particularly for, for our space, it's, it's regulated. Um, there's definitely been some, some huge flame outs of companies that have raised like a hundred million and have gone under. Um, so I, I think the, you know, the biggest thing that, that we probably learned in that time was just who's the, who's the right investor and kind of what, what we discovered was we were um, planning on raising a series A and uh, you know, we would give the same exact pitch to series A investors um, and they'd be like, wow, really interesting customers just seems a little early. We give that same pitch to seed investors and they're like, whoa, you guys have done an amazing amount of progress uh, for only raising the amount of money that you've had. So Right. That, that was the the piece that we took away was finding that that uh, really time frame investor that matters. And and I've talked to investors where they're like, "How much are you raising?" And you give them a number, and they're like, "Whoa, that's a lot for a Series A." And you're like, "All right, well, what if we called it a a B? Like, 
you know, people get caught <laughs> up in names more than they should, but right. it, it definitely frames how how people view progress and round size and, and all of that stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they do kind of force you into a box, don't they, right? If you're on this side or that side. I was just talking to a, a different company here in Colorado that wanted to go out and say they were raising a Series A. And they probably got the revenue for a Series A, but you know, I, I questioned whether or not that's what they should call it. I was like, you might as well just do a big seed round. And then your Series A, you'll just be crushing all the metrics, right? It's all semantics, not all semantics, but there are some semantics. Um, and they had, just hadn't thought of it like that. And I was like, yeah, it's important, like you said, right? I mean, you gotta kind of figure out where you fit. Yeah. Um, and like we, we had talked to, or like some of my, you know, mentors, advisors, or just, you know, people that uh, I know, I, I tell them we were doing a 5 million seed round and they're like, what? That's, that's not a seed round. Um, that, you know, but it, it definitely matters. And I think the most important point is um, for each step that you go along the way, there's just different milestones, different metrics that, that people look at. And there's this one, one company um, that uh, I knew, and it was a perfect example where um, they, they raised the Series A um, and I think probably tripled revenue from that point, but they went to go raise their B and now they were getting revenue multiples for evaluation instead of, you know, something that's a little more fluffy. Um, so it, each step along the way just gets harder and harder in turn, or just more specific around that. And unless you're, you're really firing on all cylinders, it's hard to, um, get that sense of urgency of like, Hey, why should someone invest in you now? Yeah. So what do you do to deal with all the uncertainty? I mean, cause there's a lot of uncertainty, like what's, what's your trick? How do you, how do you carry the weight? Um, I think just main thing is put your all into it. Like, uh, you know, particularly as the founder is just you're going to wear a lot of hats and it's like you can't uh you can't let sales slow down you can't let code slow down even though you're probably spending most of your time fundraising so it you know it's just uh one of those things that uh you have to you know just be super passionate and dedicated about to to work on that it's hard to close any round and the bigger they get the the harder it is to, to get that going. Um, so the best thing you can do is just have a ton of traction and, and a reason why um, people will be asking to invest instead of you kind of hoping they will. Mm -hmm. But in terms of you know, the uncertainty, I think uh, I just focus on you know, what are the things that I can control. And there's, there's plenty of things, whether it's regulations, you, know, you name it, that are totally outside of our control. So, um, I know personally, that's just what, what I always focus on and worry about is if I can't control it or have an impact on it, I try not to let it suck up too much brain power. Yeah. Well, I mean, I feel that you have a very calm and steady demeanor. You know, I think that as a leader, that's, you set a good tone for the people that are around you. Uh, you know, at least that's the impression that I have, right? That if you're, if you're feeling a lot of pressure or uncertainty, that doesn't, that energy doesn't radiate out to other people and freak out everybody else. Um, Cause as a leader of the organization, I mean, you set the tone, right? So if you're freaking out, then everybody <laughs> else has a reason to freak out too, right? <laughs> exactly. Well, I think that's just me personally. Like uh, um, if I have super good news, like I, I'm not going to get too high. If I have super bad news, it's not going to get too low. Um, so, um, my wife, my co-founder, you know, they joke, it's like, Hey, I need to multiply this reaction to get like a normal person response. So, um, <laughs> hopefully that's good. But I mean, uh, there's definitely, uh, big wins, big, big losses and, um, press announcements, uh, competitors doing stuff like there's just going to be a lot going on the more more successful you get. So you just need to um, 
enjoy it as best you can, really. <laughs> right. Well, we're almost out of time. The thing I always like to end on is just ask you, I mean, you know, you take the mic for a minute and you're talking to entrepreneurs who are either in the trenches in this early stage pre-funded or they're thinking about jumping in to build their dream. You know, what would you have wanted to know before you went and did this the first time? What's going to help somebody else the most? So I, I think uh, one of the things that I've seen some, some interesting examples of lately is um, a lot of companies that uh, develop a, a nice way to have a, a really successful business that may not be a venture scale business. And uh, yeah, I think we're, we're seeing more of that across a bunch of different industries, whether it's like, you can have a really successful podcast, right? Or, or any, any sort of thing that might be at a smaller um, global scale, but could be like a really massive, amazing business for, for you. Um, and like, uh, I think Gumroad is a pretty cool example. Um, I don't know if you know them, but they, um, essentially let you kind of sell content in, in a cool way. And they were on the venture path and couldn't get, get money, had to downsize the team and along the way got profitable and are now super successful just at a different scale. So mm -hmm. I think just, you know, look at the the size and scope of what you're going after. And I think figure out, um, do you wanna waste time even thinking about getting funded? Like I certainly was thinking about that for, for a long time for like other ventures of mine, um, but you know, they weren't, they didn't quite have that ambitious uh, kind of upside. So I think just mm -hmm. recognize like, what what are you really going after? and I think there's plenty of room to, you know, to build amazing businesses where um, you're not venture backed, but that's, that's kind of a good place to be too. So mm -hmm. recognize what that opportunity is. And, and if it is uh, something where it's like, Hey, we need a bunch of capital to, to do some of this stuff, then um, and go for it. But I think just being mindful about that early on. And we've probably been on the Kitty side, we probably, done that uh, just mindfulness a little bit um, where um, I think we certainly have a lot of competitors that have raised like 10x more than we have, um, but they're probably in a worse spot than we are um, for a lot of reasons. So uh, I think just at every step along the way, each new check, like the, the targets get higher, the outcomes need to get higher. Um, you know, do you, what's that uh, opportunity for, for the business that you're building? And, uh, and then in terms of like outcomes, what, what's the, the range or likely outcome? And, uh, you know, for each, each amount of uh, round you raise or each extra million you raise, like there's probably few and fewer companies that could buy you. Um, mm -hmm. And so, you know, once you get to a certain level, it's like, all right, this is either going to be like a massive acquisition or not. And it almost becomes a little more binary. Um, so you have yeah. kind of early on, you have some really interesting optionality to raise no money, raise a little money. Um, you know, but I think if you can get to that um, place, we have a lot of traction, um, business is growing. You know, I think there's, mm -hmm. there's ways to, um, find the right path of, hey, do we stay on this crazy venture ride or, you know, do we kind of find a sustainable path going forward? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love that, uh, you know, kind of the, the personal, like being honest with yourself about, you know, do I have a high growth business or do I have like a cash flowing regular business, right? And, and acknowledging it for what it is, because I, the same as you, I've seen a lot of founders that have tried to take something that's a great business and try to kind of force it into the mold of being high growth. And it, it, it can destroy a perfectly good opportunity, right? Because you try to go down this route. Um, I also tend to agree a lot on, you know, raising, you know, like you said, you know, some companies that have raised 10 X what you have, but they're not necessarily in a better position. Money can cause as many problems as it can fix it, especially for the founder, right? Because 
every time you raise money, you just set the bar a little higher for getting out. Right. Yeah. And not that not that you have to get out like that's not the right term, probably, but for having a successful exit. Yeah. So at what point do you um, do you at least leave that kind of all right, cool, let's go raise X amount of money and burn through it in the next 18 months? Um, I've seen some interesting discussions around, you know, what what would Twitter be like if they had like 100 employees and they, you know, they could easily have, uh, um, you know, probably same size type business, you know, at a, at a different kind of kind of level um, instead of doing a bunch of rounds that maybe they didn't have to do, but kind of needed to 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 keep that that growth curve going. So I think it's just an interesting thought experiment of, you know, what what's the right kind of sustainability for you. Um, and then just looking at, at founder math too, like um, if you sell for uh, let's say 10 million early on, that could be just as good as selling for a hundred or 200, mm -hmm. a few rounds down the road. So it, you know, it kind of, there's just a lot to, to consider when you think about, hey, what's the exit? How much, how much equity do I have? and mm -hmm. what might that be worth? Right. And how much effort does it take to get to that other bit too, right? Yeah. Getting to a $10 million exit could be a very different experience than getting to a $200 million exit with potentially comparable outcomes, right? For you personally. Yeah, no, it, it's interesting if you kind of model it out where, um, yeah, depending on the, the size of the outcome plus the time to get there, um, Mm -hmm. A lot of times, small exit could be could be better. Totally agree. Yeah. I wish more founders would take the smaller outcomes and not get too caught up in it. Yeah, for sure. Um, well, Jonathan, thanks for taking all this time with us today. Loved hearing your story and you know, kind of learning like how you can do this yourself, right? And take an opportunity into your own hands and create validation that that gets you to a place that you can be able to build something. That's, I mean, I still just love that, right? That you're you're building the infrastructure for the next century of flight. I think that that's awesome. I hope that's your tagline. I guess I don't know what your tagline is, but I love it. <laughs> I know. Uh, yeah. Not officially, so, but maybe we can work that in. Cool. Well, thanks, for <laughs> Yeah, let's, let's work it in. All right. Thanks so much. And thank you to everyone that, that joined us today. You're the best.